This is my second visit to Argonne and my second lecture here. The first one was almost an era ago when I had a lot more hair on my head and a lot of excitement. Those were the days when high TC superconductivity has, had just dawned upon us. It was 1987 or so. For the last four and a half years, I am managing this building that you see on the screen and also managing the people who live inside this. The later part is a little difficult, challenging. Maintaining the building is much more <laughs> convenient. Uh, this is India's very first public funded laboratory. It was established before independence, six months before independence actually in 1947. And uh, we also happen to be the National Metrology Institute of India. This is like the NIST here in the United States and PTB in Germany and NIM in Japan and other places. So we have a very special mandate to upkeep the na national standards of measurement and continuously improve them by research so that we are at par with the rest of the world. It's a major challenge and to fulfill this objective about 40% of our scientists are engaged in metrology related activities. Just to give you an idea, if you are, we are all aware with the SI system of units, you have seven base units. You have time, you have length, you have mass, you have temperature, you have intensity of light candela, you have current in ampere, you have the intensity, uh, you have the mole amount of substance, so seven base units and a National Metrology Institute is supposed to keep the primary standards of all these base units. And today the challenge is to have all these base units in terms of quantum variables. No more artifacts. The kilogram is still an artifact, which is about a kilogram weight of platinum iridium alloy. At India we have replica number 57. I think the United States has replica number seven or so. The original replica, the very first one is kept at BIPM in Paris. But all other variables are slowly being changed to quantum, uh, quantum variables, so they should be, access, you are, the, the quantity should be expressible in terms of fundamental constants like the Planck's constant, the speed of light in vacuum, electronic charge, Boltzmann constant, and Avogadro's number. So that whatever measurement you do here, or you do it somewhere else, it becomes invariant of time and space. That's the challenge. And out of these seven base units so far, four have been converted to quantum. Three more needs to be done. Particularly kilogram is the biggest challenge today, how to convert kilogram, express it in terms of Planck's constant. Today I will talk more about uh, the, the research which I'm directly involved in, in addition to doing, taking care of my administration and, and the standards and related activities. And this is going to be uh, basically in the area of uh, quantum phases and phase transitions at oxide interfaces. Now before I start, let me acknowledge all my students at National Physical Laboratory in Delhi and also at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. And uh, our collaborators, Nicola Bergiel and Jerome Lassier at ESPCI Paris, who have been doing a large number of, it's a very intense collaboration with the French group, and also with uh, Ime Zhu and his colleagues at Brookhaven. They do high resolution electron microscopy and electron spectroscopy for us. And these are our various funding agencies. We have international programs, for example, the Indo-French, a joint program between India and the French government. Uh, which supports the activity with Nicola and Jerome. And then we also have Indo-US Science and Technology Forum. This is a new initiative which I have, I'm working together with Sam and Ime Zhu at Brookhaven. All right, so the lecture has following components. First, I'm going to tell you how transition metal oxide interfaces offer a unique opportunity to tailor materials properties. I will take a very specific example of 
lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate interface. And then I will move on to a different material. Most of the world is working on this particular interface, so-called LAOSTO. We have taken a different route. We are focusing on a MOT insulator, band insulator interface. So the MOT insulator is lanthanum titanate, and the base is, again, strontium titanate. And I will try to establish how, what are the differences between lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate system versus lanthanum titanate strontium titanate. It's a very important issue here. And then I will talk about the formation of two-dimensional electron gas, effects of perturbations like optical and electrostatic field on the properties of this 2D gas. I will talk about two-dimensional superconductivity and quantum phase transitions. And finally, if time permits, I will talk about <coughs> condo scattering in these systems and how condo and spin orbit interaction these two compete at a very low temperature. All right, let's start with, uh, with a, a perovskite oxide, AMO3, where M is a transition metal, and A can be a rare earth or an alkaline earth. And we all know that the transition metal sits at the center of this octahedral cage of oxygen ions. And in this octahedral field, the five-fold degenerate 3D orbital splits into two groups of states. And in, this, in, the, in the context of this particular talk, these states, XY, YZ, and ZX, T2, T2Z states play a very important role. Now, if I take two different perovskite oxides and create an interface in this manner, then at the interface, I can have a direct overlap between orbitals. And this direct overlap between orbitals can lead to exchange interaction between transition metal ions. And if you have some oxygen here at the interface, then you can also have a super exchange through the oxygen ions. And a beautiful example of that is here. If you take strontium manganese oxide here, the manganese in three, D3 state configuration, and lanthanum manganese oxide, here it is D4. And at the interface, one can have an interaction between MN3 and MN4 through an oxygen ion. And that's what gives you the so-called double exchange, a special case of super exchange. And because of that double exchange, the interface can be ferromagnetic. Also, it can be metallic. And beautiful work in this area has been done here at Argonne. I would like to quote this paper. So you have MN3 plus MN4 plus double exchange at the interface, and it can lead to interfacial ferromagnetism in this particular problem. One can also have superconductivity. For example, this is not a perovskite, but a similar family of compound. You take overdoped lanthanum strontium copper oxide with strontium doping about 45% or so. So it is no more a superconductor, it's a Fermi liquid. And if you make an interface between this and undoped lanthanum copper oxide, it turns out that the interface becomes superconducting with a TC as high as 45 to 50 K. Another purely interface driven phenomena. And one more interesting example of this interface effect is the so-called, you have at the interface, you have breaking of the inversion symmetry. And once you have the inversion symmetry is broken, you have a built-in electric field at the interface perpendicular to the interface. And now if you consider one electron which is moving along the interface with a certain velocity v, in the frame of reference of this electron, this electric field will appear as a magnetic field. And that magnetic field can interact with the spin of the electron and lead to spin precession. And this is so-called the Rashba spin orbit interaction. And you can write down the B field because of this, comes from special theory of relativity. And one can write down the Rashba Hamiltonian. And uh, you see that the, the, the Rashba spin orbit interaction relaxation time, it goes, it depends on the strength of the interfacial electric field and the diffusion coefficient of the, of the electrons. So it's a very exciting problem. Happens purely because of the interface. And, uh, one important consequence of this spin-orbit interaction is in the diffusive motion of electrons. 
For example, if you have a two-dimensional electron gas, and you consider an electron at point O, and you consider two partial waves, one is going in the clockwise direction, and as it goes, it scatters from these impurities. These are purely elastic scattering. So during the scattering process, there is no change of phase. And you consider another partial wave, which is going in the counterclockwise direction, and when these two partial waves meet at point O, you have constructive interference. And because of that constructive interference, the backscattering probability of electron goes up. This is called quantum diffusion in 2D, and this is what leads to the so-called weak localization. It's basically happening because of constructive interference between two partial waves. And what you see is an important consequence of weak localization is a log of T dependence of sheet resistance at very low temperatures. <clears throat> now, if you have strong spin orbit interaction in the problem, then what happens is as this electron goes around the orbit, it can acquire an additional phase because now you are operating on the spin part of the wave function and this constructive interference is sort of blocked. So what you see is the weak localization is stopped and you go in, an, in, an, in a regime which is called weak anti-localization. So the resistivity will no more grow as a log of T at very low temperatures, it will become flat. It's a one signature of weak anti-localization which is coming because of the spin orbit interaction. Now I will discuss some of these issues in the case of this particular interface. A famous paper published in 2004 by Otomo and Wang. What they did, they started with a strontium titanate substrate, 001 oriented in this direction. It has TiO2 termination. And then they grow lanthanum aluminate on top of this in a layer by layer manner using pulse laser deposition. And you can count how many layers you have deposited by simply looking at the reflection, high energy electron diffraction, the read oscillations. And what they did, no, before I, I go, what, uh, before I tell you what actually happened, if you look at the, uh, if you look, consider lanthanum aluminate, it is a polar dielectric with a band gap of about 5.3 electron volt. And strontium titanate is 3.2 electron volt. Both are highly insulating materials. But it turns out that if you deposit here something like five to six unit cells of lanthanum aluminate on top of this, the interface actually becomes highly conducting. And you actually have a two-dimensional electron gas at the interface. The simple region, simple explanation for this, is the band bending at the interface between strontium titanate and lanthanum aluminate. So the conduction band comes down, crosses the Fermi energy. And if you look at the lanthanum aluminate, as I said, it's a polar dielectric. So you have these charged layers, LaO, ALO2 and so on and so forth. The transfer of electron from here into this triangular well. So the electrons are now confined in this direction along the Z direction, but in the XY plane they are free to move. So you have a two dimensional electron gas confined along the Z direction. And one can, by doing a, a, a measurement of uh, magneto resistance, one can figure out whether it is indeed a two dimensional electron gas or not. So one has to do something called the Subnikov d Haas measurement. And so in the magneto resistance Rxx, if you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, you see these oscillations in the resistance as a function of one over B. And if you tilt the field away from perpendicular configuration, the oscillations disappear. So that's a clear signature that you are dealing with a two dimensional electron gas with a cylindrical Fermi surface. But there are certain constraints under which you will observe these oscillations, and those constraints are decided by this condition, omega c tau, which is omega c is the cyclotron frequency of the electron, tau is the elastic scattering time, it must be greater than one. That puts a condition on the magnetic field, B. And also, you have to have this energy scale, this energy must be greater than the thermal energy K beta t, and all these conditions are satisfied roughly around one Kelvin, five Tesla field, when you have a mobility of about 3,000 centimeters square volt second. So very low temperature, high mobility samples will show you 
clean Subnikov de Haas oscillations. Now, this is all that has been done. A lot more has been done on lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate interface. We wanted to take a different path because we wanted to actually address this issue of polarization catastrophe and also a little bit of mod physics. So we took this material, lanthanum titanate. And lanthanum titanate is a cubic perovskite with a lattice parameter of 3.94 angstroms, has a perfect lattice match with strontium titanate. And uh, here, the titanium exists in 3D1 configuration. So you have one electron per formula unit. And the standard band theory tells you that it should be a metal, but it is not because of the strong correlation effects. It is a mott insulator with a uh, uh, Hubbard U of roughly about five electron volt. It is not likely to show the, the polarization catastrophe because titanium can exist in three plus and four plus states. So there's a difference between aluminum and titanium. Aluminum, the valence is fixed, three, three plus. Here it can be three plus and four plus. And the mod Hubbard gap is very small, 0.3 electron volt, whereas the band gap in lanthanum aluminate is 5.3. <coughs> so these are two different beasts altogether. And we will try to show you that whatever manifestations are, they are actually the same. So, so what we have done is, we have gone slightly beyond that. We have used lanthanum titanium O3, but then we are also now using lanthanum vanadium O3, lanthanum chromium O3, going across the 3D transition series and trying to find out how the interface properties change as I grow from the left to the right hand side of the periodic table. This is how we make our samples. This is a PLD facility at the National Physical Laboratory, which was set up in the last three, four years. We have two krypton fluoride excimer lasers in the back. And these two excimer lasers feed into six deposition chambers. So we can split the beam through mir mirrors and take them in different places. And we look at the read oscillations intensity, and we can monitor how many layers have been grown on top of strontium titanate. This is a slightly larger view of the same facility. As I said, the laser excimer laser in the back feeds into various chambers here, here, and the one is over here, and then there are more over there. So a variety of materials can be grown using laser processing. It's a very powerful technique that way. Now, I'm going to talk about a few perturbations that we have used to manipulate the properties of this 2D gas. And the first one is electrostatic gating. Electrostatic gating is a well-known figure taken from a textbook. You have, uh, you have this channel, you have a source, you have a drain, you put a dielectric and apply a gate field on the top. Depending on the polarity of the gate, you can either induce charges here or you can withdraw charges here. So it becomes a very good control in, 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 in deciding the conductivity of the channel. And uh, how well the gating is going to work depends on this parameter, the so-called Thomas Fermi screening length. So if I have the gate, gate dielectric here, I apply a positive charge. This is my semiconductor, which I'm trying to modify. There will be a band bending at the interface, and the length scale over this band bending is effective, is decided by the so-called Thomas Fermi screening length. It depends on the dielectric function of the semiconductor and the gate material, also on the density of states of the semiconductor at the Fermi energy. So if I have a metal, you can see very high density of states in the denominator. The Thomas Fermi screening length is only two, three angstroms. On the other hand, if I take strontium titanate, it can be several nanometers, 100 nanometers. So it becomes a very important tuning parameter. And uh, this is how we apply the gate, very simple. Uh, what we do is instead of using a top gate, we use the 0.5 millimeter thick strontium titanate substrate as our gate dielectric. We metallize it from the back, and then we can apply really brutal gate field somewhere around from 1,000 volts to minus 1,000 volts. You wouldn't like to do that in your cryostat, but this works beautifully because the gate dielectric is very robust. So even at 1,000 volts, the leakage current is negligible. One would like to apply a top gate so that you can work with 5 to 10 volts. Unfortunately, the top gate does not work. It always leakage current is very high. 
Okay, so let us now look at the properties of two structures. One is 10 angstroms of lanthanum titanate on strontium titanate, the other is 15 unit cells. And we measure the resistivity as a function of temperature, the sheet resistance. And it starts coming down, a quadratic temperature dependence here. Then you see a small shallow minimum. Here the minimum is slightly more. And then eventually, roughly around 300 millikelvin or so, it becomes superconducting. If I blow up this area, you have a very clear superconducting transition. Somewhere on such is about 0.3 K, slightly lower here. And if I measure the current versus voltage characteristics, when I'm sitting at 300 millikelvin, 310 millikelvin, I have a perfectly ohmic behavior, which tells me that I'm in the normal state. And as I cool it down to lower and lower temperatures, I start seeing well-defined critical current. That's a clear signature that I'm dealing with robust superconductivity in this material. One can extract the critical fields of this superconducting state. We have done these measurements by applying the magnetic field perpendicular to the plane and as well as in the plane. So you have two critical fields, HC parallel and HC perpendicular. And uh, so this is the formula for the perpendicular critical field. It goes as one over xi squared, the coherence length squared. And if I have the magnetic field in the plane, then one dimension is limited by the thickness of this 2D layer. So you still have, so you have D times the coherence length. If I measure this, I measure this, I can extract my D. And that D comes out to be roughly about 12 to 15 nanometers. So that is the thickness of my two dimensional superconductor at the interface. Now, we can tune this superconducting state by applying the gate field. It becomes a very important tuning parameter. And as you can see over here, this is a slightly different sample. In, at zero gate voltage, the, you barely see the onset here. Apply a positive gate, the TC goes up. Apply a negative gate, the sample becomes non-superconducting. I can draw the phase diagram. So this is TC versus gate field, and you can see that Roughly around when I'm in the positive gate voltage regime, I start seeing the superconducting with a typical dome, the maximum TC of about, in this particular case, is about 0.2K, but maximum you can go up to about 3.3 Kelvin. And uh, this also shows the behavior of sheet resistance, and one can plot sheet resistance versus TC. Again, you get another scale in the problem. So as you can see here, this is TC as a function of gate voltage. So at zero positive gate, it is going up like that. And the sheet resistance has a highly nonlinear behavior with respect to the gate voltage. It's not perfect, it's not linear. So response in the negative side is very different from response in the positive side. Now we have done measurements of Hall coefficient and magneto resistance up to very high magnetic fields something like 45 to 50 Tesla. These experiments were done in Toulouse in France, again done by Jerome and, 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 and his students. And what you see here is, if I am at minus 200 gate voltage, I have a perfectly linear Hall resistance. Almost a free electron-like behavior. But if I make the gate voltage positive, positive 200, I start seeing this curvature. But I've reversed the field, there is no hysteresis. So I cannot say that this is happening because of some sort of an anomalous Hall effect coming because of magnetism in the problem. To these days, many people are talking about ferromagnetism at the interface, coexisting with superconductivity. But our data suggests that there is no, no ferromagnetism. We have not seen any signatures of that. This curvature is essentially, it can be interpreted in terms of two band, a two-band picture where you have two types of electrons, electrons with very high mobility and electrons with very low mobility. And if I put that in the two band formula, I can extract the mobilities of the high mobility carriers, nu2 here, and the low mobility carriers here, and are, these are corresponding carrier densities. 
And these two type of carriers come as you apply the gate voltage. It has something to do with the band structure, the titanium T2G states. So if you look at the dispersion of these bands, XY, YZ, and ZX, it turns out that initially you have XY. You start filling, filling putting carriers in XY, which has very little dispersion. These electrons are very sluggish. The mobilities are low. And if you keep on applying more and more gate voltage, then you start pulling these two down, which are almost degenerate. And you start putting carriers in those bands. And these bands are much more dispersed. So the mobility is much, mobility is much higher. So this two band picture sort of explains why there is a curvature in the Hall resistance at very high positive gate voltage. Now I'll talk about the uh, superconductor to weakly localized metal continuous quantum phase transition in the system. Because it's a very, very attractive system in a way because you can tune the superconducting, you can tune the, the Coulomb interaction between the carriers by simply changing the carrier con concentration through a gate voltage. And you can also change the interaction between the vortices by applying a perpendicular magnetic field. So you can make the material, you can derive it from or push it from the superconducting state to a non-superconducting state by using two variables, the carrier concentration and magnetic field. So this is the result. Uh, we are, this measurement has been done at 80 volts positive gate voltage. This is at zero magnetic field, superconducting transition. And as you keep on applying more and more field, the, the TC drops. And finally, somewhere here, the sample enters in the normal state. But I would like to tell you that if you look at the value of sheet resistance here, it's only about 400 ohm square. And the quantum resistance for localization is about 6.5 kilo ohm square. So we are still in the metallic state, although we have gotten rid of the superconductivity. And uh, if I just blow up this section here and look at the temperature from 1 0.2, 0.12 to 0.22, I see a, a region where the sheet resistance becomes, for a particular value of magnetic field, the sheet resistance becomes independent of temperature. This is a signature of continuous quantum phase transition. And that critical value of magnetic field is here, and the critical value of sheet resistance is here. At this value of magnetic field and sheet resistance, the sheet resistance becomes independent of temperature over that temperature window. Now, if I just keep blowing up this, this portion a little more and go to still lower temperatures from somewhere 0 0.06 to about 100 millikelvin, I find another region here where the resistance is independent of temperature. It defines another critical resistance, Rc, and a corresponding critical field, Bc. And these are signatures of a continuous quantum phase transition in the system from a superconductor to a weakly localized metal. One can do a detailed anal analysis of this quantum phase transition. And what I have done here is we have plotted, now instead of plotting temperature here, we have plotted the magnetic field as a function of sheet resistance. And each of these are actually an isotherm. For a given value of temperature, this is how the sheet resistance is changing as a function of magnetic field. And you will see that this, at this critical field, B sub x, all these curves cross. So this is a uniquely defined magnetic field, again a signature of a quantum phase transition. And one can collapse, one can do a scaling analysis. We have followed, followed the approach of Alan Goldman uh, in describing the continuous quantum phase transition in two-dimensional superconductors. One can extract, extract the critical exponents. And it's very clear that we have two continuous quantum phase transitions in the system. Now one would like to ask why two, why not only one? And we have an explanation for that. And that comes from that two carrier model, which I described in the beginning. So as I said, we have very low mobility carriers. Their number density is very large. And we have high mobility carriers, their number density is small. So in this picture, this yellow cloud is made by the low mobility carriers, which do not superconduct. 
Superconductivity condensation takes place only in the high mobility carriers and they form these superconducting puddles. Now there are two length scales in the problem. One is the size of the puddle L sub D and the second length scale is L sub phi that is the phase correlation length, the length scale over which one puddle talks to the other puddle. So there is a phase correlation. Now if I look at the, the evolution of this phase correlation length L sub phi as a function of temperature, this is how it goes. So below, above this temperature T sub D, my L sub phi is smaller than L D. So I am in one regime where the puddles are not talking to each other. That is my first quantum phase transition. And once I go to very, very low temperatures, my L phi becomes larger than L sub D. Now the puddles talk to each other and we are dealing with a different state. And this manifests itself as a separate value of critical fields B, C and the critical resistance RC. All right, now I would like to talk to you about the second perturbation, a very exciting experiment. This is when you shine light on this, something very remarkable happens. So what we have used is we have used two sources of light. One is about 100 watt quartz halogen lamp. And the second one is a helium cadmium laser. It gives two wavelengths, 325 and 441 nanometers. And uh, intensity of 441 is 10 times more than 325. Much brighter blue line than the UV line. And now if I take the light from a quartz halogen lamp and feed it into a spectrometer, what I get is the spectral content of that light. And you will see that a quartz halogen lamp, most of the light is in the visible range. A very small here is UV. So now, do we do that experiment? Initially, my sample sheet resistance is close to about 4.5, 4.6 kilo ohm. At this point, we open the shutter and expose the sample to the quartz halogen lamp light. And you see this dramatic drop in resistance. And it continues to drop. And at this point, if I switch off the light, it starts recovering. But it takes forever to recover. You take the time, look at the time scale here, about 3,000 seconds. About seven to eight hours to get back to the original state. And if I keep on increasing the intensity, the response becomes more. But now let's look, let us see what happens when I use the laser light. When I use 442, 441, which is blue, and 10 times brighter, there's hardly any change. On the other hand, if I use 325, you see this. So it's sensitive only to UV light. It's blind to visible light. All that photoconductivity is coming because of the UV light. And actually, the explanation is when you shine light, you are you are generating electrons, electron hole pairs in the strontium titanate. Those, those electrons move towards the interface because of the electric field at the interface and contribute to conductivity. And when you switch, switch off the light, these carriers have to go back to their original place. And it takes them forever to do that because they go through a potential landscape, get trapped and retrapped and trapped and retrapped. And that comes out from the dynamics. And now I'm coming to a very important issue here because we have compared the photoresponse of lanthanum titanate strontium titanate system, which we study, and lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate system, which the rest of the world is studying. What is the difference between the two? And it turns out that the dynamics is essentially the same. It does not matter whether you have LAO on the top or you have STO on the top, uh, LTO on the top. The dynamics of the 2D gas is essentially the same. The superconductivity is the same. The magnetoresistance resistance is the same. So if I look at uh, this behavior, I can work out the recovery process. I define this quantity delta R over R dark, which is delta R is the resistance in dark minus resistance at time t after exposing it. And you will see that it follows this stressed exponential behavior with an exponent beta. And you know when beta is equal to 1, you have the Debye relaxation process with well-defined activation energy. On the other hand, if you have a potential landscape with several activation energies, 
then you will get beta less than 1. And this is what we see here. We can extract the activation energy and the details of all this work are given in these two, two papers, how the system recovers and what is the recovery dynamics and all that. And the question is, why is this sensitive only to UV light? So we did some band structure calculations for the interface. And it turns out that when I take TiO2 terminated strontium titanate surface, my band gap is only 0.81 electron volt on, at the surface. And once I put two unit cells of LaO, this reduces to 0.7. If I put three, it reduces to 0 0.02. And finally, at four unit cells of LaO, it actually becomes a metal. And that's what the experimental observation is. And if you look at the transitions from the valence band to the conduction band, most of these transitions lie in the UV range. And that's why the system is sensitive to UV light. So we have conduct calculated the optical conductivity, and you can see that it starts showing up above about 2.2, 2.3 electron volt energy. Now I want to talk about the electrical transport in this system, which is also quite exciting. And uh, I will show you two, two plots here. The resistivity of LTO, STO system. You start cooling down, it's a perfect metal, and then you see a minimum, and then it starts saturating. If I blow up this section, this is what you have. This is in a log scale now. So well-defined minimum here, then some sort of a log T divergence, and finally saturation. And the same behavior is seen if I take LAO, STO. So this minimum followed by saturation is sort of a universal phenomena in the problem. Question is, why is this is happening? To figure this out, you really have to be a Sherlock Holmes because there are complicated, uh, several competing interactions which contribute to this. And uh, the very first is the so-called weak localization or the quantum diffusion in 2D. And if you look at the behavior there, the resistance, the change in resistance goes as log of t. And that's what we see small over here. But if I look at the quantum correction to electron-electron interaction picture in 2D, there also you see this log of t. So it's very difficult to say whether it's electron-electron interaction effect or it's happening because of the weak localization. You can resolve this dilemma by measuring the magnitude resistance. The magnitude resistance in the case of weak localization is negative and is also anisotropic. It's a negative magnetic resistance when the magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the plane of the 2D gas. On the other hand, so weak localization is an orbital effect and it gives rise to very strong negative magnetic resistance and the field dependence goes as log of h, log of field. On the other hand, electron-electron interaction effect is generally isotropic, should give positive magnetic resistance and goes as square of the field. So magnetic resistance is the key to differentiate between electron-electron interaction and weak localization. Now, the one puzzle still remains, why is there a saturation at very low temperature? Weak localization doesn't predict that. And neither does electron-electron interaction. So one has to look for something else. So why is there a saturation at the lowest temperature? And for that, we come back to the quantum diffusion picture, which I showed in the beginning. So if you have spin orbit interaction, which is very much relevant in this case because you are breaking the inversion symmetry, you have rush by spin orbit interaction, and because of that, you can have so-called weak anti-localization, and that will lead to the saturation effect at very low temperatures. But the story does not end there. So one can work out the details of the weak lo anti-localization theory, and in the simplest form, the change in resistance is given in terms of this, where B sub phi is your elastic field, and it is related to elastic scattering time, tau phi. And uh, it turns out that the weak anti-localization theory, in its simplest form, which is written over here, predicts a positive magnitude resistance at very low fields and a neg negative magnitude resistance at very high fields. And I'll show you that it actually indeed, that's what happens. 
But spin orbit interaction is a very complex beast. Rashba is one of that, one aspect of it. But if you have magnetic impurities in your system, you will have spin orbit interaction. Particularly if you have magnetic impurities with high Z. And also you can have spin orbit interaction if the system lacks inversion symmetry in the bulk, the so-called Dresselhaus effect. And finally, you have the spin orbit interaction due to lack of inversion symmetry at the interface and the so-called Rashba effect. And how do you know which one of these is acting in our problem? One has to look at the behavior of the, of the relaxation time, the spin orbit relaxation time. The dependence is very different in the case of Rashba and in the case of Dresselhaus effect. Okay. So the question is, is the saturation of heat resistance at low T, lowest temperature, is a consequence of the spin orbit interaction or there is something else to it? There is one more, uh, one more uh, piece of this puzzle and that is the condo scattering. We all know about condo scattering in dilute alloys. You have antiferromagnetic exchange between conduction electrons and localized magnetic impurities. And this leads like, to a condo contribution to resistance at very low temperatures, which goes as log of T. And the condo effect also saturates at the lowest temperature. That saturation happens because at very low temperatures, the conduction electrons completely screen the impurity moment. There is a singlet formation below the condo temperature Tk, and then the resistance starts saturating. So the question is, what we are seeing in our problem is it condo or is it the weak local anti-localization effect? So for that, one has to do detailed magneto resistance measurements. I will not go into the detailed theory of this condo here. So one can actually have two contributions. One can have a condo here as well as the weak anti-localization effect. So one can make it much more rigorous by looking at the complete uh, Maikawa Fukuyama theory of spin orbit interaction becomes becomes lengthy, which we are trying to analyze now. But actually, one has to take into account both the effects, the condo as well as the weak anti-localization. So now, is there a time limitation, Sam? Five minutes, okay. So now this is an interesting experiment which we have just started doing. What we are doing is we are changing the properties of this 2D electron gas See, first we change the properties by shining light, by applying a gate field. What we are doing here is we are putting something else at the interface. So you have strontium titanate. On top of that, you have lanthanum titanate. And we delta dope it with different transition metal perovskite. In this particular case, we have used lanthanum chromate. Lanthanum chromate is an antiferromagnetic insulator with a nail temperature of 290K. What we do is we change the thickness of this. We go from fraction of a monolayer to several monolayers and see how the properties of the 2D gas are changing as a function of delta doping. And you see something very remarkable. So this is delta layer thickness and this is your uh, uh, carrier concentration. So initially at zero delta doping, the carrier concentration is typically about 2 into 10 raised to the power 14 carriers per centimeter square. And as you increase the delta layer thickness, it comes down to roughly about 10 raised to the power 12. So you can suppress the carrier density by doing delta doping. And similarly, the resistance keeps going up. So it becomes a third tuning parameter in the problem. But for this, you have to make a new sample every time. It is not like you have one sample and you tune the gate voltage or shine light. And this is a electron microscopy, rigorous microscopy work done at Brookhaven by Ime and his, his, his uh, colleagues. And this is your chromate layer. This is LTO, this is STO and we have done energy, electron energy loss. And electron energy loss spectroscopy clearly suggests that the chromate layer is, is acting as an electron blocking layer. So the electrons from LTO are not being transferred to the interface, the top layer of strontium titanate. They are being blocked by the chromate. And there is a change in the valence of the chromate. Instead of being 3 plus, it goes to 2 plus. And the density functional calculations also suggest that there is a change in the valence of the chromate. So the chromate layer is actually acting as an electron blocking layer. Now what happens to transport? Now let me talk about magneto resistance a little bit here. So this is the magneto resistance of 
delta is equal to zero, no delta doping. This is in zero magnetic field. You have this minimum and then log T and then saturation. And now you apply, start applying a magnetic field perpendicular, you see a very large positive magneto resistance. If it is weak localization, the magneto resistance should have been negative. It is not. So we have ruled out the possibility of weak localization in the problem. One can also measure for the other delta value, keep on doing. So you see that as you increase the delta layer thickness, your resistance goes up. The minimum shifts to slightly higher temperatures, becomes more pronounced, and, but the log T and saturation remains. And uh, one can also measure the magneto resistance as a function of field. And this is some data here. Uh, as you can see here, this is for perpendicular magnetic field at different temperatures, 2K, 10K, and, and about 20K. Here, the, the symbols are here. And you see that perpendicular magnetic field, the magneto resistance has a typical H square dependence, which comes essentially because of the classical orbital scattering. But when the magnetic field is in the plane, the magneto resistance is actually negative. So here the condo starts showing up. You can keep going this, and you see that at very low temperatures, actually now, this quadratic field dependence of magneto resistance changes, you have a different shape here. And at, in the parallel field, you start seeing first positive magneto resistance and then magneto negative magneto resistance. And this whole thing can be modeled in the framework of these two theories. So the first at 10K is perfect condo model. And as you go to lower temperatures, your spin orbit starts growing, becoming stronger. So here then you have to take both the contributions, condo as well as spin orbit interaction, and one can model the behavior nicely. Now one more puzzle, one few minutes I will take. Uh, if condo scattering is relevant, then it's one important manifestation of that is large thermoelectric power. So what is the thermoelectric power of these systems? Uh, so we have done these measurements in our PPMS, thermo power measurements up to about 14 Tesla field, down to 1.6, 1.7 K. And this is a homemade fixture, sits on the PPMS puck. So you have sample here sitting on a diving board, small heater here and a sensor, you establish a temperature gradient, apply magnetic field perpendicular. A second diving board, it's not actually a diving board, it goes up. And uh, again, you establish a temperature gradient and magnetic field is also in the same direction. And you can see that, uh, uh, so <clears throat> the essential aspect is, if you look at the thermal power S, it depends on the heat current, also depends on the charge current, and it will depend on the entropy carried by uh, charge carriers, but it also depends on the entropy carried by uh, excitations such as uh, phonons, magnons, and free spins. Those can also contribute to thermal power. And if you look at the formula uh, for thermoelectric power, the standard MOT formula is written here. Diffuse thermal power has two components. One depends on the energy derivative of the density of states at the Fermi energy. The second one is the mobility energy dependence of the mobility at the firm energy. And for a two-dimensional electron gas, the diffuse thermal power is linear in temperature. So let us see what we find. This is the thermoelectric power plotted in a log scale. Here it is a linear scale. So first of all, you see here perfectly linear behavior, suggestive of a 2D electron gas. But here you see a minimum, sorry, not a minimum, as a maximum in thermal power at a certain temperature where you see the minimum in condo resistivity. So there is a, a direct correlation that the thermal power is actually enhanced in the condo regime. So thermal power seems to suggest that indeed there is a condo scattering in the problem. And uh, why should the thermal, now should the thermal power be magnetic field dependent in the case of condo? Uh, it turns out that yes, it should be because we should consider this simple picture. I have an impurity spin here. It is being screened by conduction electrons. I have another impurity spin here with down spin. This is also being screened. Now, if this electron goes from here to here, it carries not only the charge along with it, it also carries the entropy because the spin has to flip. And that can contribute to thermal power. So the thermal power in the condo regime must be very sensitive to magnetic field. And it turns out that indeed it is very sensitive. So this is thermal power 
in magnetic field minus in zero field divided by zero field times 100 in percentage. And this is the data you see, something like 24, 25% change when I increase the field from zero to about 12 Tesla. It's a huge effect. And it happens, the maximum change occurs at the quantum minimum. So you see that for other sample and the next one. And uh, the most puzzling aspect of this, which you are still not able to resolve, is that if I measure the thermoelectric power in parallel field and in perpendicular field, it turns out that the behavior in both the cases is the same. Roughly about 24% in this case at 20K, but hardly any change when I go from in-plane to out-of-plane magnetic field configuration. The question is, why is it happening? On the other hand, the magneto resistance changes dramatically when I go from parallel field to perpendicular field. But the thermal power does not change. So how do I explain it, uh, this particular phenomena? So I go back to the Mott formula where you have energy derivative of the density of states and energy derivative of the mobility. And our contention is that it is the energy derivative of the density of states which is contributing to thermal power mostly here. And that should be independent of the direction of the field. So that's the conclusion. So with that, I can conclude. So first of all, uh, we have shown that there is a 2D electron gas at the lanthanum titanate strontium titanate interface. And this 2D gas behaves exactly in the same manner as the well-studied 2D electron gas at lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate interface. And so our conclusion is it is plain titanium D0, D1 physics, which is relevant here. It's all happening on the top few surfaces of strontium titanate. Uh, the mechanism for formation of this gas appears to be transfer of the titanium D1 electron to the interface, which can be blocked by putting a chromate layer. And uh, the 2D gas can be manipulated by applying a gate field and by light. We have seen superconductivity in this system, which is again identical as the superconductivity seen in LAO STO system. And uh, Important thing is, this is such these 2D electron gases in oxide interfaces are candidate systems to study the superconductor insulator or superconductor normal metal quantum phase transition. Because it allows you a beautiful tuning parameter gate voltage, you can go from insulating to superconducting. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so uh, finally here, magneto transport in parallel field is dominated by condo scattering. The condo impurities are presumably titanium-3 plus polarons. This I did not stress upon, but there is some spectroscopic evidence for that. And finally, our direct support to condo scattering is provided by thermal power measurements, which is very large and extremely sensitive to a magnetic field. So thank you very much. <laughs>